Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome back to Reading with Raptors on a Tuesday morning here. I am hanging out in a different room than usual with our one of our resident great horned owls, who we call Lois. Um, she's looking around, I had scattered a few pieces of food around on the turf here, so she was kind of looking around for some of those as we were kind of getting started. Um, so as one of our resident great horned owls, Lois, the great horned owl, is really well suited and well adapted to life out in really, really cold temperatures, which is great. So we're kind of getting into February here. We are deep in winter here in Minnesota. We've got some cold temperatures coming up this morning. And we have our very fun February holiday of Valentine's Day coming up. Um, if you haven't seen already, if you check out the <laughs> postings on our Facebook page or on our website at theraptorcenter.org, uh, we have a really exciting online Valentine's Valentine's Day program coming up. It's on going to be on Friday, February 12th at 7 p.m. So check that out if you are interested. Um, we have, like I said, I think the last post on our Facebook page here is about that program. So definitely check that out if you're interested in some kind of unique up close topics on raptors and nesting season for Valentine's Day. So check that one out. Otherwise, in that kind of February cold weather winter theme, I found this amazing book called Over and Under the Snow. It is by Kate Messner with art by Christopher Silas Neal. It is just adorable artwork. I'll show you lots of close-ups of this artwork because I think it is absolutely adorable and really unique. So I was really excited about this one. Um, so we're going to be reading that as we talk a little bit about those kind of winter adaptations and behaviors that a lot of these birds do. She's kind of sitting right in the middle of where this needs to go. So I'll just scooch this over just slightly. So we've got a little bit of room for the book while also looking at this great horned owl. She is currently doing some of those um, kind of squawking vocalizations that you're hearing. Normally great horned owls are doing a lot of that classic kind of hoot hoot kind of noises that we might see or hear from her as well. But the little squawking noises are actually a uh, noise that normally only young owls make called a food begging call. We'll talk about that maybe at the end. We'll talk a little bit more about this owl and why she's making normally young owl noises. So we'll get back to her. This is over and under the snow. <laughs> Wandering off here. <laughs> See where she all ends up moving to. Over the snow I glide into woods frosted fresh and white. <laughs> You can see these beautiful winter trees, lots of birch trees, as these two folks go out skiing. <laughs> Over the snow, a flash of fur, a red squirrel disappears down a crack. Where did he go? Under the snow, Dad says. You can see the beautiful forest, our two friends over here, and then up here, we have this little squirrel tail disappearing down into a little hole in the snow. What is that squirrel up to? Let's see if I can ask our owl over here to maybe move to somewhere where we can actually see her a little bit more. Her head was right behind the perch. Under the snow, a whole secret kingdom where the smallest forest animals stay safe and warm. You're skiing over them now. Here's this underground area, that squirrel that disappeared earlier is underneath near the base of the tree. You can see the roots. You can see the squirrel with its acorn. Down here, you can see another small critter staying nice and warm, surrounded by leaves. You can see that's under the snow and our two folks up here skiing away over the snow. Oh, there's a little, there's a little mouse down here too. I didn't notice it. Oh, a familiar face here. Over the snow I glide, past beech trees rattling leftover leaves and strong silent pines that stretch to the sky. On a high branch, a great horned owl keeps watch. Under the snow, a tiny shrew dodges columns of ice it follows a cool tunnel along the moss out of sight. So here we have our, here, we'll do a side-by-side -side great horned owl comparison. 
so you can see it keeping watch up in the trees as they ski along underneath there's this secret world with a little shrew with its kind of long shrew-like face and that long little tail skittering around underneath the snow down by the moss and all the little seeds and things that might be down on the ground <laughs> Look, Dad says, tracks. Tracks always tell a story. <laughs> Over the snow, a deer has crossed our path. Deep hoof prints punch through the crust up the hill under a tree. An oval of melted snow tells the story of a good night's <laughs> sleep. Under the snow, deer mice doze. They huddle up, cuddle up against the cold in a nest of feathers and fur. <laughs> So here is above the snow, you can see this nice kind of circle where a deer maybe spent the night, the warmth of its body maybe melted some of the snow into a little divot and you can see the hoof prints going away. And underneath the snow down here, we have a little, a little pocket of mice down here surrounded by a nice warm cozy nest of leaves and feathers and some grasses, keeping nice and toasty warm all winter long. Our owl guest seems to really want to stand right behind the bow perch, which is okay. Well, maybe when we're done reading, we'll see if we can get her to stand somewhere we can see her a little bit better. Over the snow, I climb, digging in my edges so I don't slide back down. Under the snow, voles scratch through slippery tunnels, searching for morsels from summer feasts. So here our friends are sliding up, skiing up this hill. And underneath we have these voles, which are kind of similar to mice, running around down under the ground, looking for just any little bits of food they can find <laughs> underneath the snow. Over the snow I swoosh, down, down, faster, faster, down, faster, faster, whoops! Under the snow, a snowshoe hare watches from a shelter of spruce. Almost invisible, she smooths her coat, or she smooths her fur, a coat of winter white. So here we have our brave young skier making her way down the hill, and then maybe losing a little bit of balance. And over here, really well hidden underneath this tree, do you see this tiny snowshoe hair all curled up into a nice little ball, staying nice and hidden and nice and warm? That white fur for the winter, keeping her toasty warm. <laughs> Over the snow I glide, past reeds where tadpoles play tag in springtime. Under the snow, fat bullfrogs snooze <laughs> They dream of sun-warmed days back when they had tails. So here we have our two skiers are up here. And then here are these reeds and a couple of fish who are maybe making their way through the water during the cold weather. But down here we have our bullfrogs staying nice and toasty warm down in the kind of frozen over mud, staying nice and toasty warm, or at least keeping themselves from being too cold rather. They're probably pretty chilly. But keeping themselves nicely hibernating during the winter. Where are we going? Let's to rotate this a little bit. Over the snow, I stand and stare. Little mountains in the marsh. Under the snow, beavers gnaw on aspen bark, settled in for supper. Can they hear my tummy rumbling too? Over the snow, stop, a sound. We stand like statues carved in ice till a bushy-tailed fox steps from a thicket, tips his ear to the ground, listens, listens, listens still. Here we have this little mountain in the marsh, the snow-covered beaver den where they have stockpiled some nice plants to eat. And then here we have a fox walking by, listening for something. What could it be? Let's find out. <laughs> after listening, the fox leaps out onto the snow after an invisible dinner. 
His paws scratch away to find the mouse he heard scritch, scritch, scratching along underneath, under the snow. So here we have this fox pouncing head first, feet first, onto this little <laughs> mouse who's been running around underneath the snow. So using that excellent hearing to find this little mouse, even underneath that nice thick layer of snow. Very talented fox. Over the snow I glide. A full moon lights my path to supper. Under the snow, a chipmunk wakes for a meal. Bedroom, kitchen, hallway, his house under my feet. Well, here we have our two friends skiing away towards that full moon <laughs> under the snow. You can see this nice little cavern that this little chipmunk has made. So there's a nice little cache of food, maybe a spot for sleeping, a nice little tunnel. Oops, nice little tunnel leading up over here. That's what's going on underneath. <laughs> Over the snow, I climb one last hill. Bonfire smoke rises, warm hands, hot cocoa, hot dogs sizzling on pointed sticks. Under the snow, a black bear snores, still full of October blueberries and trout. So we have our two skiers way up here on the top of the hill. And down here, snoozing underneath the snow, we have this black bear hibernating for the winter, being fed and kind of fueled by all the great food that it found this last uh, kind of fall. So this bear would have stocked up on food during the fall and now is sleeping it all off all winter long. Over the snow, the fire crackles and sparks shoot up to the stars. I lick sticky marshmallow from my lips and lean back with heavy eyes. Shadows dance in the flames. Under the snow, a queen bumblebee drowses away December all alone. She'll rule a new colony in spring. Maybe hopefully those of us from colder climates with this kind of winter weather will probably recognize this kind of outdoor bonfire during the winter with kind of roasting up some food, maybe having some marshmallows, having some good hot chocolate to stay warm while this fire keeps us nice and toasty. But down here underneath the leaves and the snow is a bumblebee who's actually keeping warm and all by herself. So we'll start a new colony in the spring. Lots of insects are actually keeping warm outside right now, hibernating away the winter. Over the snow, I glide home on tired legs. Clouds whisper down feathery soft flakes. So here we have now three skiers making their way back home. This beautiful big open patch of snow, the starry night, a little bit of snow coming down. Oh, sounds beautiful. <laughs> Under the covers, I snuggle deep and drift into dreams. I like that this is set up just like all those small forest creatures were snuggling up underneath the snow. <laughs> so these are dreams of cuddling deer mice and slumbering frogs, hungry beavers and tunneling voles, drowsy bears and busy squirrels, and the secret <laughs> kingdom under the snow. So here's this big nighttime scene. You can see the constellations up here look like all the different animals that we saw or saw signs of. We see a squirrel and an owl. We see a mouse, a bear. So you can see all these different animals kind of up there in the stars. There's a little bit of kind of information about each of these. Maybe we can read a few of those. So here is an author's note kind of about the animals in this book. There really is a secret kingdom under the snow. Scientists call it the Subnivian Zone. It's a network of small open spaces and tunnels between the snowpack and the ground. It's created when heat from the ground melts some of the snow next to it and leaves a layer of air just above the dirt and fallen leaves. Many animals depend on the subnivian zone to survive the winter. 
For one thing, the snow acts like the insulation in our houses and keeps the subnibian zone close to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, even when the air outside is much colder. Small rodents like mice, moles, and voles travel under the snow because it helps keep them safe from predators, animals like hawks that would like to eat them. Some predators get tricky though. Weasels have skinny bodies and can squeeze into the tunnels in search of prey. Red foxes, like the one in this story, have fantastic hearing. They listen carefully for noises under the snow and can figure out just when and where to pounce to collapse the tunnel and trap a mouse for a meal. If you go cross-country skiing or snowshoeing in the woods, you might see tracks in the snow that lead to tree trunks or crevices and then disappear. Look carefully. Those trunks probably tell the story of an animal from the subnibian zone, the secret kingdom under the snow. The animals you meet in this book really do eat, sleep, hide, and play over and under the winter snow. Red squirrels not only travel and hide under the snow, but also store food underground. They hide seeds and nuts in holes or under rocks and use their fantastic sense of smell to find them later when they're hungry. Shrews are little animals like mice that sometimes become meals for great horned owls and other predators, so subnibian tunnels provide important shelter. Here's a little pictures up close to these remind us we had the squirrel we had this little shrew with its long little face white-tailed deer like to sleep under coniferous trees or evergreens with cones that provide shelter on winter nights when they curl up to sleep some of the snow underneath them melts making deer beds easy to spot in the woods deer mice make nests out of grasses, leaves, and other bits of plants, and line them with soft, mo uh, soft moss, fur, and feathers. Mice often sleep huddled together in winter to conserve heat. Voles look a lot like large mice, but with shorter tails and smaller eyes and ears. Like mice and shrews, voles forage for food under the snow, searching for seeds, bark, roots and insects. Snowshoe hares are famous for their seasonal color change. In the summer, these hares have a coat that's reddish brown or gray, but as winter approaches, they shed that hair and replace it with white hair to blend in with the snow. That makes it much easier for the snowshoe hare to hide from predators. I mean, look at this round little white ball of fluff. It would really blend in out in the snow, wouldn't it? A few more facts about some of the animals that we saw. Bullfrogs hibernate, buried in the mud at the bottom of ponds and marshes in the wintertime. Did you know that you can tell the difference between a male bullfrog and a female bullfrog by the size of their tympanum? That's a fancy word for ear. On a male bullfrog, the ear is about twice the size of their eye, while a female bullfrog's ear is about the same size as her eye. So the males just have really big spots for their ears. Beavers don't hibernate in the winter, but they're less active, so they don't need as much food. Whole families spend the coldest months huddled together inside their frozen lodges. Before winter sets in, Beavers pile branches and twigs at the bottom of the pond, not far from the entrance to the lodge. That serves as their winter food supply, and they'll dive down under the ice when it's time to eat. They make their own refrigerators. How cool is that? Red foxes often eat small mammals like mice, voles, and shrews, but finding those animals can be challenging in winter. The red fox has an excellent sense of hearing though, and will actually listen for the sounds of animals like mice under the snow. When a fox hears a mouse, it will pounce, often with all four feet on one spot, to collapse the snow and trap the mouse underneath. Then it will dig until it finds its dinner. Chipmunks dig burrows in the earth and live there under the snow in the wintertime. A chipmunk's home often has different chambers, 
one for sleeping, one for storing food, and several tunnels for exiting and entering the burrow. Black bears sleep most of the winter. Before they go to sleep, they gorge themselves on foods like fish and berries so they'll have enough energy to last until spring. Their dens might be in hollowed out trees, under logs or rocks, or in caves. And finally, bumblebees don't all survive winter in cold climates. In fact, male and worker bees often die in the fall, leaving only fertilized queen bees alive. The queen bumblebees hibernate in the soil or under a layer of leaves. They can even produce their own antifreeze to keep from freezing if temperatures drop too low. When the queen emerges in spring, she'll find a cool, dark place to nest, often in abandoned mouse den, and lay her eggs to start a new colony. Some really fascinating ways that animals have of surviving the winter. This one actually has a few. I'll just kind of zoom in so if people want to see. There are a couple of different books and websites and some further reading for maybe parents and teachers up here. I won't read through those, but there's a good look at that. There's some great ideas of websites or books that you can check out if you're interested in learning more about what animals do in the winter. So this is the back of the book. And then here's the front. This was Over and Under the Snow by Kate Messner with art by Christopher Silas Neal. Let's go back over here and see if we can maybe have our great horned owl join us a little bit closer up here up front. I figured the food would probably be pretty intriguing. Can come up here? So this is one of our resident great horned owls. Like I said, we call her Lois. You were hearing her make a lot of kind of unusual noises for an adult great horned owl. This owl is 21 years old this year, I believe. So she is definitely an adult great horned owl and has been an adult great horned owl for quite a long time. So normally the main noises that an adult great horned owl would be making would be those classic hooting noises. <laughs> then when they do that hooting noises, you'll often see that kind of white patch at her throat kind of puff up and get nice and big. So, let's come over here. I'm really interested in the food that I have. I have nothing else. So most of the kind of squawking noises that you're hearing are noises that normally only young owls make. They usually make them to their parents to say, hey, I want food. I would like some food, please. So we call them food begging calls. And so she is making those because she is actually what we call a human imprint. When she was a young bird, she was growing up in her nest and she was supposed to imprint or kind of mentally kind of map onto adult great horned owls like her parents or also see her siblings and imprint on great horned owls. However, when she was a youngster, she ended up out of her nest. Great horned owls don't usually build their own nests. They usually find old nests from old hawks or other kind of crows or ravens. So a lot of times those nests can get a little sketchy, a little iffy as we get into the springtime. Or a curious young owl might be out wandering around on the branches and fall down. Either way, she ended up out of her nest and some very well-intentioned folks found her but didn't know the best way to help her. So she was being raised by people for a period of time. So instead of imprinting on owls like she's supposed to, she imprinted on humans. So we call her a human imprint. Basically means that part of her brain that was supposed to learn how to be an owl and how to interact with things as an owl didn't really function the right way. She doesn't really know how to be an adult great horned owl like she's supposed to. So because of that, she cannot go back out into the wild and has been living with us for almost her entire life um, because she doesn't know how to be an adult great horned owl. That is why she's making some of those noises that normally only a baby owl would make. Normally an adult owl would be very, very quiet, very still. They usually use this kind of camouflage that they have, those kind of really nicely blended together colors. They usually use that and those tufts of feathers you see sticking up out of her head they really help them camouflage with the kind of lines of bark on a tree. So they're able to um, really stay very nicely hidden, stay very, very um, kind of silent and still using their huge eyes and their huge ears to find their food. And then they'll swoop down and pounce. 
Just like the fox in our story today, they will often kind of punch down through the snow. If you're really lucky, actually this time of year, if you're in an area that has snow, you can sometimes see these owl prints. You'll see a um, kind of a full kind of spread of owl wings, kind of like on the snow spread out, where they've kind of swooped down and grabbed a small animal out of the snow. And you can see where their wings kind of impacted in the ground before they grabbed onto that small animal and flew away with them. So if you keep a close eye out, if you're somewhere with snow, keep an eye out for those signs of owls. It's always really exciting to see. So that is what normally the owls are out doing right now. We are getting into great horned owl nesting season. A lot of the owls here have been making quite a bit of noise. I know the ones in my neighborhood have been making a lot of chatter as well, because it's getting to be that time of year. They're one of our earliest nesters up here in Minnesota. Um, we often will see them nesting as early as February, so we are getting into it here. Um, we usually will see some young great horned owls in as early as late February or kind of early March. So they're some of our earliest nesters up here. Um, so they're able to nest pretty early on. That way there's plenty of food for them and their youngsters since everyone else kind of starts to get more active as we get into the springtime. And it means that they're early enough to snag those leftover hawk and crow nests before either of those birds get back. So they are able to do some very early hunting. It's a nice little chunk of rat for her. Oh, we're gonna take it back there. I was excited that she was up here so we could see her, so I figured I'd give her a piece of food. But I'm just gonna swallow that big chunk of rat further away from the camera. So you can see that nice kind of white patch on her throat. That's kind of what will puff up a little bit um, when you see great horned owls vocalizing. So definitely something to keep an ear out for right now, especially around sunrise and sunset. This is true for everyone here in kind of North, Central, and South America. Um, the nesting season might be a little bit different depending on where you are if you're pretty far south, but for those of us here in North America, it is getting into great horned owl nesting season. So keep an ear out for those classic kind of hoot hoot calls and keep an eye out for those great horned owls maybe moving around trying to find a good nesting spot, doing their territorial displays. So keep an eye out for those. I'm going to scroll back. I saw a couple of things kind of come up in the chat. A couple of folks who are familiar, this great horned owl is one of our birds who has been doing programs for quite a long time. So a lot of people are pretty familiar, which is always pretty exciting. Awesome. I will say too, so this again, it's a great time of year. We're starting to just get into the very start of that kind of nesting season with the great horned owls, but a lot of our other raptors and other bird species will be soon behind, especially those who have been here all winter long. You can see she has these really fluffy feathers. When she's up close, you can see she had those really big. I don't have any more pieces of food for her though. I'm kind of out. Um, but you can see she has these really big fluffy feathers on her feet that are great for staying nice and toasty warm, kind of keeping her feet nice and protected from anything that she's trying to grab onto as well. But those fluffy feathers really help keep great horned owls nice and toasty warm all winter long, even though whew, we have some negative temperatures coming up this weekend, with that kind of Arctic blast of air that's going to be coming through here in Minnesota. So they will be nice and toasty warm with those nice warm feathers. Um, again, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I know we just did a post about it here on Facebook, but you can also check out our website at theraptorcenter.org. Um, we do, kind of with the nesting season in mind, we have a Valentine's Day online program we're very excited about. If you're interested in that, um, it'll be at uh, 7 o'clock Central Time uh, for uh, February 12th. That's a Friday right before Valentine's Day. If you're interested in a fun online program with some kind of extra goodies that we'll send to you um, to make a kind of fun night out of it before Valentine's Day, definitely check that out. We're really excited about it. And um, we hope to see a lot of you all there, but check out the Facebook post that we made a little bit earlier on. I'm sure we'll be posting about it again as it comes up. Um, so you can check that out, see if you're interested. Otherwise, folks, I don't see any other questions about our great horned owl here. So now she's kind of showing off these great, you can see her huge feet, perfect for grabbing onto all sorts of small animals. You can see really nice big toes and talons that are great for grabbing onto all sorts of animals from mice to rats to rabbits to squirrels, all sorts of things that great horned owls might be looking out for as we're finishing off the winter here. Uh, here in Minnesota at least. We've still got a couple months left. So lots of different foods that great horned owls are out looking for right now. 
Otherwise, everyone, as always, you can check us out here on Facebook and online at theraptorcenter.org. We're also on Instagram at the Raptor Center. You can check us out there. Otherwise, everyone, keep an eye on all those things. We will hopefully see you next week for more Reading with Raptors. Have a great week. Until then, stay warm. Everyone, stay safe, even if you're out checking out all of those signs of small animals out in the snow. Have a great week, everyone.